From Eyewitness News, this is Newsmakers. Two months after an agreement with Iran was announced, Rhode Island Congressman David Cicilline is still struggling with how he will vote. Could the dyed-in-the-wool Democrat go against President Obama's marquee foreign policy initiative? Plus, how worried is a longtime Hillary Clinton supporter about the possible candidacy of Joe Biden? Our guest this week on Newsmakers, Congressman David Cicilline. Welcome to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. Joining me on the panel is WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi. Congressman, welcome back to the program. It's really good to have you. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. Let's start with Iran. If the vote on the Iran deal were today, what would it be? Um, look, I have spent the last eight weeks, uh, almost two months, studying this issue very carefully. I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee and the Middle East Subcommittee, so this is an area of my uh, jurisdiction in the subcommittee. Uh, I've had the benefit of reviewing all the classified documents, attending a number of classified briefings. We've had a couple of hearings in the Foreign Affairs Committee. I've also had the opportunity to reach out to some real experts in this region, Dr. Haas from the Council on Foreign Relations, Samantha Power, our U.S. Ambassador, uh, Nick Burns, the former ambassador during the Bush years that was responsible for Iran, to really get their best thinking. And uh, this is a very, very difficult issue and something that I want to make sure that I get right. So I'm going through this due diligence. There are lots of good things about this agreement in terms of reducing the number of centrifuges and the level of enrichment for uranium, a very intrusive uh, inspection regime. Uh, so I think the first part of this agreement, that 10, 12-year uh, timelines, uh, we can be reasonably certain that Iran cannot move to a nuclear weapon. It's really at the conclusion of those terms where advanced centrifuges are available, higher levels of enrichment, that the greatest risk is presented. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the challenge that we face is that Iran will get a, about $60 billion in revenues that it can use to continue to engage in very destabilizing activities around the region. Uh, the president would say in response to that that we have to confront them, which we do, uh, but that it's better to be confronting an Iran that's not a nuclear power, which is a fair argument. Um, I've recently uh, I've met with the president along with uh, colleagues. The president wrote back to us and answered a number of questions we raised in a letter to Congressman Nadler. Uh, I sent a letter to the president earlier this week with some specific questions about some post-agreement actions that the United States could take to mitigate some of the risks in the agreement and to reassure some of our regions in the, and uh, allies in the region. Uh, I'm, awaiting for, House, okay, that I'm awaiting for a response to, to that, and I hope once I get that, that I'll be in a position to announce a final decision. Are you leaning any which way at this point? Um, you know, again, I, I think this is one of the situations in which you can, I've identified some very good things in this agreement, but it's, as Ambassador Burns said, I think he said it best, there are real risks in this agreement, and there are big trade-offs. Now, he comes down on the side of there are risks worth taking and trade-offs worth making. I think that's the question. Um, are we better off going forward with this agreement than not? And again, this is one, this is a vote of conscience. This is a vote which you'll live with for the rest of your life. I don't just make sure that I get it right for the people that I have a, the privilege of representing in Washington. A lot of Democrats are saying, look, that the alternative to this deal is probably war. Uh, you know, Jack Reed and Sheldon Whitehouse both said when they came out for it that they, they just didn't see any good alternative to this. I mean, do you see alternatives they don't? No, I think the, there is no question that the goal is to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear power. And the question is, what is the best way to achieve that? And now that we're faced confronted with an agreement that has been negotiated by the president along with the P5 plus one. Uh, does this agreement provide enough safeguards uh, to be certain that Iran will not become a nuclear power? And I do think the idea of rejecting it presents some real challenges. I mean, two things could happen. Iran could comply with the agreement anyway and get sanctions relief from our European partners so they can still engage in the destabilizing activities and isolate the United States. Or they could do worse. They could rush to a bomb in 90 days um, and have a, a bomb in a very short period of time. That would be the worst outcome. Uh, so th that's right. I think one of the things that you have to look at very carefully is not just the terms of the agreement, but what's the consequences of a rejection of the agreement? Because you can't sort of imagine another agreement. We can all find stuff in the agreement we don't like, uh, but we can't sort of imagine another one. This is the agreement. I think it's very clear that the likelihood of going back to the negotiating table is not a practical a response. And so uh, I think it has to weigh very heavily. When I spoke to the president, one of the things he made, uh, one of the points he made was, Rejection of this agreement will have consequences not just for me as the president, but for every successive president in this country, their ability to negotiate important international agreements. I think it's a fair point. It's something that weighs very heavily. You're Jewish. Is your faith playing a role in this decision? 
I think there's no question that our that we have a very special relationship between our two countries, between the United States and Israel. They are a very important ally in the region. Um, I think you bring to your work your all of your life experiences, and I, um, as a Jew, I, there's no question that that's part of my life experience. So, but ultimately, the decision I will make will be what is in the best national security interest of the United States. That's my responsibility. We have to ask you about uh, Hillary Clinton. How do you think she has handled this uh, long-running now controversy? Uh, it seems like there is a new uh, question popping up every day now about her emails and her server and her, this whole scandal. What do you think of how she's handled it? Well, the first thing I would say is um, I, I agree with you that this is an issue which has consumed a lot of Hillary Clinton's campaign. And it's regrettable because she's a woman who has a tremendous record of achievement, who served as uh, the first lady of our country, as a United States senator, as a secretary of state. She has a record of fighting for working families and a, a real vision for our country to, to, to really rebuild the middle class of America. So every moment she's speaking about emails or email coverage and not about those issues, I think, is unfortunate. The reality is, I think she's acknowledged that she didn't handle this well, and then in retrospect, having a, her own server was not a good idea, and that she hasn't, she, you know, communicated about it well. Um, there was a piece yesterday in uh, the USA Today from the U.S. attorney who prosecuted David Petraeus who said very convincingly that there's no evidence of any criminal wrongdoing. So knowing that, you sort of wish there were a way she could put this to rest. Um, and I, I suppose, you know, hindsight is 2020. that if she had back, you know, when it first happened, came forward and said, you know, this was a, this was, as I think about it more carefully, this was not a good idea. Um, it had some you know, I'll do everything I can to provide all the information that's necessary, but try to sort of acknowledge it early on and put it to rest. But I got to tell you, you know, to be honest with you, Congressman, if, if this were a Republican Secretary of State running for president, you would be, you know, a spitfire on this and say this would probably prevent, or I, I'd assume that's you'd be uh, the way you'd be. Uh, this would preclude them from being president of the United States. Are you sort no, of playing politics? No, on no, that? I don't so think it preclude. Look, I think she, the secretary, has acknowledged that having a separate server was a bad idea. She's acknowledged that if she had thought about it more carefully. Uh, she thought it would be easier for her, and it's turned out not to be, of course. Uh, and that she's also said unequivocally that she didn't receive classified documents. So, and, and also, as I said, there was a PCSD from a U.S. attorney who did a very careful review of it. Having said all that, it, this is not helpful to her campaign. And what I really wonder is, you know, it would have been helpful if people around her, staffing, maybe suggested this is not a good way to operate. Here's why. Um, but, but the reality is what I think most Americans are focused on is who is going to be our next president who's committed to, you know, rebuilding the infrastructure of our country. In ensuring that we make college affordable, protecting Social Security and Medicare, you know, developing a sensible co uh, climate plan for our, for our planet so that we can respond to global climate change. Well, one person talking Raising about doing, wages doing, doing those things is uh, maybe Joe Biden, the vice president, who's now very clearly flirting with it. I mean, what do you think? Should he run? Look, I, I, the decision about whether or not to run for president of the United States is a incredibly personal decision. I have enormous respect for the vice president. He's a beloved political leader in our country. He's been a great vice president. If he decided to enter this race, he would be a formidable candidate. But I think nobody can make that decision for you. That's something he'll, he'll decide after doing his own kind of introspection, talking to his wonderful family, and then he'll decide whether it's right. Uh, we're speaking with Congressman David Cicilline on Newsmakers this week. Some heartbreaking photos out of Europe uh, this week. A four-year-old boy, a Syrian boy, drowned on a beach. A real humanitarian crisis uh, with refugees. Should the United States be doing more? Well, first of all, we're living in a time where we have the highest number of refugees and internally displaced persons since World War II. Almost 60 million individuals. Uh, this issue in Syria, where there are about 9 million Syrian refugees, is a crisis. There's no question about it. The United States is clearly doing its part in terms of resources. Uh, we're the most generous donor uh, in terms of the refugee problem. There are many countries who are not doing their part in terms of financial support. I think the United States has to continue to lean on those countries. Call uh, them out? Call them out. Um, and in fact, I was recently in a refugee camp, and one of the things we spoke about was getting a list of who are the countries who have the capacity uh, to be doing more or not doing what, where more. Were one, in, uh, in Jordan. It was a Syrian refugee camp. But the other thing we have to figure out is, you know, how do we uh, absorb more of these refugees who are fleeing war and violence in places all over the world? You know, 
uh, in Jordan, they've absorbed a million and a half Syrian refugees that they have in camps that they're housing, feeding, clothing, and even the really poor refugees they provide a stipend to. Jordan's not a rich country. There's no oil. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a huge undertaking for them to absorb that uh, population. So we have to be part of an international community that is responding to this crisis. The United States has always played a leadership role. We're the most generous donor. But this is a crisis that we've not seen before this level since the Second World War. We have to be willing to be a big part of that and do all that we can to respond to this humanitarian crisis. You recently introduced uh, and made a big splash with legislation called the Equality Act, which, uh, as I understand it, would amend the Civil Rights Act to put the same protections for Americans based on sexual orientation as race and gender. Um, what, you know, what, I guess, what problem, what issue that someone could run into do you think the Equality Act would protect them from? Well, under existing law, there is actually no federal protection. Uh, against discrimination based on sexual orientation or gender identity. Uh, there's no federal protection, and in a majority of the states, there's no state protection. So that in a majority of states, you can be discriminated against, you know, fired from your job, even though you're qualified because you're gay or lesbian, kicked out of an apartment, denied public accommodations in a restaurant, uh, denied uh, an educational opportunity. So in one of those categories, in the majority of the states, there is no protection. And so I always use the example, you could be married on Saturday, post your Facebook pictures on, on, on Facebook, your wedding pictures on Sunday, and be fired from your job or kicked out of your apartment on Monday. And so we should live in a country which, you know, ensures that no person is discriminated against because of who they are. This will take sexual orientation and gender identity and include that in all the other civil rights protections so that you can't be discriminated in housing, employment, public accommodations, jury service, education. Um, the, the interesting thing is the polling shows vast majority of Americans think this is already the law because it comports with our values that we think discrimination is wrong and people should not be discriminated against because of who they are. So it's really about Congress kind of catching up uh, to where the American people are who don't believe in this kind of discrimination. We, we just saw a clerk in Kentucky who was jailed uh, for refusing to issue uh, marriage licenses to gay couples. Do you agree with that decision or was it heavy handed? Well, uh, the clerk was jailed because of her refusal to follow and comply with a lawfully issued court order. And the reality is we live in a country of laws. And when the Supreme Court makes a determination, even if we strongly disagree with it, it's the law of the land. And we certainly couldn't live in a country in which people were able to decide which laws they accept and which laws they won't accept. But there, That's are some real, there are some real concerns that the, that decision is um, impeding on religious freedom. No, so I, I, don't, I, don't, I actually don't think that that argument is being made effectively. The reality is everyone is free to exercise their own religion. But what this decision is, it says marriage equality is the law of the land. This is a, an elected official, a government official, who is refusing to comply with a lawful court order saying issue a marriage license. And that, that's a, we cannot live in a country in which people can just sort of decide what laws to follow. We'll have anarchy. You can, look, if you disagree with that, as someone pointed out, you either run for office, you work on a campaign for a president who will appoint different kinds of people to the Supreme Court. But we have a system of government where our Supreme Court is the final arbiter, whether it was in the civil rights area, whether it's in reproductive freedom, they make the final determinations. Whether we like it or not, it's the law of the land. And government officials and state actors in particular can't just decide which ones they're gonna follow and which ones they're not. Uh, we have to go to a break, but before I do, um, we reported this week you had to go to the hospital. You whacked your head? <laughs> yes. What happened? I was fixing something in my basement, just hit my head on a fuse box door. I have three staples in it, I'm fine. There wasn't Obama that. over the Iran. Yeah, you, no, it was yeah, not. You need yeah. a better story no, than I mean, that, yes. <laughs> for sure. <laughs> All right, our guest this week is Congressman David Cicilline. When we come back, we're gonna have him weigh in on a few things happening in Providence. Stay with us, you're watching Newsmakers. Welcome back to Newsmakers. I'm Tim White. To my right is WPRI.com reporter Ted Nisi, our guest this week, Congressman David Cicilline. Congressman, I said we were going to talk a couple of things about Providence, but before we do, I do have to ask you about Gordon Fox, reported to a federal prison in July. Uh, I'm curious if you spoke with him before he left or since he's been in prison. No. You haven't. You, why, you know, why haven't you reached out? You two were good friends. No, no, I mean, he's at a place where you can't reach out. Um, you didn't write him a letter or anything no, like I that? No, I did not. Okay. Um, all right, I want to ask you about the streetcar proposal in Providence. Mayor Lorza has said it's not one of his top priorities. 
Uh, there's been a lot of critics, and uh, Governor Raimondo has even said it seems like a, a nice, a nice <coughs> to have, not a need to have, I believe was her quote. Are you still committed to the project, and are you trying to secure any more federal money for it? Well, obviously, the decision about whether or not the city of Providence goes forward with the streetcar will ultimately be the mayor's decision. So it requires uh, partnership really at this local, state, and federal level. Um, this is a decision that the mayor will make, and I expect in conjunction with the governor. Um, I, I do think that streetcars, if you look at the impact streetcars have had on cities across this country, can really be transformative in terms of moving people from work sites to home and creating the kind of transit system that leads to tremendous economic growth. Um, but you know, the mayor will have to make a decision whether based on the other priorities he has and uh, the things that he thinks are important for the success of the city, whether this is a priority and, and obviously I'll Are you disappointed his... by the tone or the lack of support? No, I, look, I'm, I think streetcars are great. I think they will ultimately be in the city of Providence because that, it was a city built on streetcars. We still have the rails in, in a lot of places around in the city. Uh, I think it would be a valuable thing to have a, an easy way for people to get around. I think the kind of millennials that are moving back into cities, transit's a really important issue. Businesses think about way, the ways they can, their workforce can get around. So I think looking at transportation issues is really important. Um, but whether or not this is the right time for the city is really the mayor's choice. And I stand ready to help in any way that I can, whether it's with that or with some other transit project or anything else the city needs. You had a famously tense relationship with the Providence Firefighters Union back when you were the mayor of Providence. Now we have uh, this this ongoing fight between Mayor Lors and them over their, their shift changes and everything. Did you as mayor ever consider going to a shift like this one? And do you share any of the concerns about, about safety for the firefighters in Providence? Um, I don't have a memory that we actually looked at this shift change. I think the North Kingston decision came out after uh, yeah. we mm -hmm. negotiated. So it wasn't sort of something that was at least commonly discussed discuss it or I remember it all. Um, and again, I think this is, these are hard issues and uh, obviously the mayor and, and the firefighters union will uh, resolve this, I hope, in a way that makes sense for the men and women on the fire department and for the taxpayers of the city. Uh, but these are tough issues and uh, they are not resolved easily and uh, I, just, I expect that as the mayor has said and as the fire union president said that the best way to resolve it is to sit down and try to figure it Do out. Do you feel a pressure to uh hold your tongue on city issues now that you're mm -hmm. as a former mayor uh, you know to not be the Monday morning quarterback yeah I mean I think look I've done that job uh, I did it for eight years I loved it I um, I know how hard it is I know the difficulty of the issues that you're presented with and I think what we owe to our new mayor is support and uh, encouragement and, and I know he's gonna do everything he can to do that job well but it's easy to sort of sit back and Monday morning quarterback I, I don't think that's valuable what was harder mayor or congressman well, I mean, they're very different jobs, and what's very frustrating Come about on. my it current was totally job. In there. Come on. <laughs> no, no, I mean, no, no, no. I mean, look, the, what's frustrating is to be in Congress working on things that you know really matter to people and not be able to get your colleagues to move some of this stuff, whether it's raising the minimum wage, fixing our infrastructure, making college affordable. I mean, the answers are there, so that part's hard. Um, but it's. It's a great privilege to be there representing our great state, so I'll never complain. All right, so Paw Sox, I, I want you to continue to dust off your mayoral <laughs> cap here for a moment. Should the Paw Sox Stadium be built in Providence? Look, I, I think like every Rhode Islander, I want to make sure the Paw Sox stay in Rhode Island. I think it would be great. And, um, you know, there's obviously conversations uh, happening between state leaders and the owners of it. Um, I ask, you know, I also ask because you live in Providence. Yeah, no, I live in Providence. So and this would impact yeah, you. Yeah, no, no, I'm, I live I'm, in Providence, and Pawtucket is in my district. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I know how important the Paw Sox are, not just to Rhode Island, but in particular to, to Pawtucket residents. It's a really important part of that city. And um, so it would be terrible if they left, but obviously the only way that they, they could stay is if the deal made sense, and I think that's going to depend a lot on what are the terms of an agreement. Would you support subsidies for a stadium in Providence? I mean, I think it's hard to make that argument uh, unless you could be convinced that there is some real economic benefit. You know, we have to be willing to use resources, and the governor had a number of them in her budget, real good economic tools, but you have to be able to demonstrate that you're producing jobs and getting some economic growth from that investment. And I think it'd be a hard case to make, but again, I, I've not seen the deal. And I, um, but I think, you know, people are, there's a lot of convincing to do that. If this is gonna happen, people will need to be convinced and it'll be the responsibility of those who are proposing it to make the case to Rhode Islanders that this makes sense. Moving back to Congress, um, you uh, you are a strong supporter of uh, uh, legal abortion and uh, Planned Parenthood. There have been these secretly recorded videos that have come out that have 
shocked a lot of people, not just um, diehard pro-lifers, people in the middle on that issue. Do you have any concerns about uh, anything that's been revealed in these videos of Planned Parenthood officials? Well, I mean, I think the most important thing to say at the outset is that Planned Parenthood provides high quality health care to millions of women and families all across this country. And actually what they do with respect to the termination of pregnancy is a very small part of their medical services. So I think people should not lose sight of the fact that, that Planned Parenthood provides valuable high quality health care to many individuals, some of whom would otherwise not have access to quality health care. Um, and part of that conversation, or part of uh, fetal, uh, fetal tissue donation, which according to the leaders of Planned Parenthood is accepted medical protocol that uh, that is done uh, uh, pursuant to accepted standards. What I think everyone would agree is that when you watch that video, the manner in which this individual spoke about this was sort of cavalier and you know, she's discussing it while she's eating a, you know, a dinner and drinking wine. I think that presented in, a, uh, in an un un unhelpful way a very serious question about fetal tissue donation. Um, and it should, I think it, it portrayed it in this sort of cavalier, uh, and I think that, that no one should be pleased with that, and everyone can, has a right to criticize that. That is not the way a professional should speak about this medical procedure. But I just don't think we can lose sight of all the incredible work uh, that Planned Parenthood does and all the health care that is provided to millions of women and families who otherwise might not have access to health care if it were not for Planned Parenthood. Do you think if, if, if you had your druthers, if you were in the majority, should there be any legal restrictions on abortion in the U.S.? Well, don't forget, there is already a prohibition in the federal government that federal funds cannot be used to perform abortions except in very limited circumstances. But do you think that's the right policy? Well, that's the, that's the Hyde Amendment. That's existing law. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it would be very hard, particularly in the current Congress, to change that. But do you want to change it? Well, I mean, I think we should... It should not be the case that individuals who seek to have an abortion are denied that ability because, of their, because they're indigent, because they're poor. So I do think that we have to be sure that that prohibition, which sometimes prevents poor women from accessing the health care that middle, you know, affluent women may have access to. I think we, that's wrong. Um, but I do think that the current prohibition against federal funding is an important kind of uh, check against people who are trying to take away the right to reproductive health care in its entirety. And so you say, if you, you know, you, you currently cannot use federal funds to do it. And I think it's, it gives us the ability to make sure that uh, there is not more serious efforts made to undermine a woman's right to and determine what medical procedures she should have on her own. Finally, body. we're looking at the potential of another government shutdown later this year. Would you support the Democrats shutting down the government to preserve federal funding for Planned Parenthood? I, I don't support the government shutting down government, uh, period. Government provides an important set of functions that people rely on uh, to lead their lives. We should not uh, shut the government down under any circumstance. And what I think we're going to you know, there's some threats of the opposite that the people in the Senate, like Senator Cruz, may try to shut the government down over this Planned Parenthood issue. I think that's a mistake. Um, government needs to continue to function. The impact, the economic impact of a government shutdown is enormous. Beyond Iran, your policies are usually in line with President Obama's, and actually you haven't made up your mind on that yet. But in his second term alone, uh, some say he's done an end run around Congress, EPA rules, delayed uh, implementation of some of Obamacare, immigration. As a member of con Congress, are you at all concerned, uh, he's setting a precedent. You know, what if a what if a Republican in 2017 does the same thing with executive orders? Look, the executive power of the president doesn't change whether you're a Republican or Democrat. The 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 office of the president comes with it a certain set of executive powers. The president has said he intends to use every bit of his executive. You power don't think he's stretched them at all? No, to advance the priorities uh, of this country, and I think he would be negligent if he didn't do that. You know, he has a responsibility to do all that he can to advance the important priorities of his administration, raising people's wages, ensuring more equality, ensuring we have a more humane immigration system, ensuring that he protects our environment. And I think it would be a but dereliction again, those, of duties. But those policies are in line with yours. What if they weren't? I, I would be unhappy that they weren't, but I would recognize that a president of the United States has the authority to use the executive power of his office. He should, he should, he or she should use it, and we can't quarrel when they do. And I think the president has made it very clear that he intends to do it. And frankly, in the face of congressional inaction on many of these issues, I, I think he's serving the interests of the American people. We're going to play that uh, back when President <laughs> Trump is, is issuing yeah. executive orders in 2017. I will completely change my position. <laughs> yes, if we're he's, ready. There's a Trump exception yeah, built right, into this. All right. So uh, we are coming up on a big election year, presidential, but also you will be up for re-election. Do you plan to run for re-election yes, next year? Yes, I do.
Absolutely, no question about it. Um, have you looked, uh, have you run the numbers, do you have political aides who do this, on whether Rhode Island right now, do you expect to lose a House seat after the census in 2020? I, I have not. I, I, you know, it's hard to know what populations will be in other states, and that will help determine, so I don't, I don't have really an idea yet brought up Donald Trump, you you and he actually sh share something in common. Yes, our support of Tom Brady. <laughs> Although apparently he's better friends with Tom Brady than well, I am, says, according to him. Is, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it was a great vindication for Tom Brady and for the Patriots and for all of us who saw the, the jealous folks who just can't <laughs> accept the idea that Tom Brady is the greatest quarterback in the history of the game. We have and less than a minute, so I, I, you are a lawyer. And I'm curious, you know, as this goes to appellate court, um, what your thoughts are on the, the process. Do you think it'll go? Well, I don't think it'll go to an appellate court. Look, I mean, think about this. The, the finding was basically Tom Brady might have had some general knowledge that somebody did something wrong and as a result is punished. I mean, it's like the star chamber. Like, that is not <laughs> justice or due process as any of us know it. And I think it was a great decision from the court from, I think, a Bush appointee. Um, but it was a Clinton appointee. A, no, no. Yeah, anyway, five seconds. Yeah. anyway, anyway we'll great check. decision for the Patriots. Patriots oh, fan and absolutely. Congressman David Cicilline, thank you very much for joining us on the program. If you missed it, it's online. For Ted Nisi, I'm Tim White. See you next week on Newsmakers.